All right, are we on air? Can you guys uh, wave if you can hear us? <laughs> there. All right. Well, he hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Zach. And I'm Chris. Uh, and we're actually uh, live streaming with you guys from inside of the Zatari refugee camp, which is um, a Syrian refugee camp about seven miles across the border uh, from Syria, uh, inside of Jordan. So this is what the camp looks like. Here's a little picture right now of, of where we are. Uh, so it's massive. And there's about 90,000 people who are living here right now, and we're just two of them uh, living in here. But uh, as you can see, this is uh, just to give you a little context of where Jordan and Syria are. So we're just, the Zafari camp is just across the border. Um, and sorry, we're, if you can't hear us, we're, you know, Things have been a little bit crazy. We actually just ran here from uh, being uh, with our neighbors inside of the camp and walking around all day today. So uh, it's uh, welcome to uh, to a, virtually to Jordan. <laughs> and the situation is pretty intense. This is the biggest refugee crisis that the world has seen in the last 20 years. There's been over 2.3 million refugees who have actually left the country of Syria and are now within the surrounding areas around the world. Um, but also within Syria, over 9.3 million people have been displaced. There's a huge amount of need, um, both in the humanitarian aid as well as um, psychological support. Um, so as, as a, you know, an American, we had seen a lot of this coverage in the news. We had heard a lot about the statistics felt so far away from the situation. You know, we didn't, never been to the Middle East before, never had, uh, didn't have any Syrian friends who had, who had gone through this situation, so we felt like we needed to be here and kind of dive a little deeper than we saw some of the coverage. Um, so we had these questions, how does a family who, you know, leaves everything they once knew uh, start to survive or start a new life in a new country as a refugee? And we, uh, so the plan, the whole project that we designed here is to actually be living here inside of the refugee camp for one month straight. So we actually partnered with uh, 1001 Media, which is this awesome production company, co-producers of this film. Uh, they have a lot more experience in the Middle East and helped uh, set us up here. But the idea is we have worked with the UNHCR, uh, the International Rescue Committee, and Save the Children. And they've set us up to be the first filmmakers ever allowed to live in a tent and go through registration in a refugee camp anywhere in the world. So for us, I mean, this was just an opportunity to actually learn firsthand, to get meet you know real people, to get the actual perspective from the people themselves, not just what we are hearing in the news, uh, and then to be able to share it with with you guys, with our friends at universities and high schools all over. Uh, all over the country and all over the world, um, and really try to get a you know more in depth uh, look at this lifestyle. So we can give you a little bit of a picture of what a, tip a typical day in Zatari looks like. Um, it starts super early at 5 a.m. Bread distribution starts, and over 500,000 pitas are distributed to every single person in the camp. So we have you know a huge operation here with food distribution. Um, and then about 60% of the camp is actually employed in some way that has some sort of work either with an organization, cleaning the streets, cleaning the bathrooms, um, and that starts around 9 a.m. Um, and you know, some, a lot of people don't have work, a lot of new arrivals still you know, are, are just arrived in the camp and getting settled. Um, and then around, then food distribution happens. Uh, dry food as well as vouchers are distributed uh, once every two weeks. Um, and so you actually go to a food distribution point, you wait in line, um, last time we did it about took about two hours, two hours yeah. uh, depends on your family size, which day you go on, um, you go through the line and you end up
Chris and Zach, sorry to interrupt you. We're getting no audio. We are also not getting any audio. How you doing, Wisconsin? <laughs> oh. Oh, cold. Yep. <laughs> Same here. What part of Minnesota are you in? Uh, about 30, 40 miles south of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Okay. And, yeah. it, and we are right here. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, I hope we get him back pretty soon here. But. So what kind of class is this? Uh, we have two classrooms, actually. One uh, junior level world history class, and then one uh, college level uh, global geography class. Yeah, how about you? Go ahead, Mr. Elson. Uh, we are freshman, sophomore, um, honors global studies, and uh, some government students, and some uh, Amnesty International Club. Wow. Very cool. This is a typical class size in Wisconsin. You believe that? <laughs> yeah. Everybody wave. Yeah. We generally have about fifty. We pack them in like sardines in Wisconsin. <laughs> and then we have two students that are from the high school across town, Parker High School. Okay. They've Very chosen cool. to join us. They have a class called Washington Seminar, and they examine current issues of the day, and then they actually go to Washington, D.C. and talk with their legislators, and um, some of them become activists for a period of time, and they have to do research and stuff. It's a neat program. Yeah, that is really neat. So Very two neat. of them are studying the Syrian refugee, refugee crisis as their big project. Wow, this is perfect for them, then. Absolutely. Yeah. We're uh, we're trying to check our emails to see if they're contacting us with any info. But. Um, do you know how to find the group chat? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on the group chat. We try to chat with them. Yeah, it says that Zach left group chat, and it looks like they actually dropped out, so they're probably gonna try and join again. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody that's watching live. So actually, there. Beyond the people participating in this Hangout are other Google Plus users just watching from their kitchen tables. Yeah. So I know, for example, my brother is just like out in California just watching all of this happen. So they're not participating, but they're watching. So pretty neat. Uh, no one's moderating yet. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Looks like they're back. Sorry about that. We're back. So it turns out internet inside of refugee camps can be uh, can be a little bit iffy. So sorry. We're. Do uh, you guys just give us a? Yeah, we're all good. No. <laughs> yeah, we got you though. Okay. So did you uh, do you know what the this is what the last thing we said was? You were talking about like uh, bread lines and how they prepare the, or how they receive food every day. Okay, awesome. Okay, so it was a while ago. We've been talking for a while. Uh, <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> so there's. Uh, so bread lines happen every morning from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. There's 500,000 pitas that are distributed every single day. The huge operation run by the World Food Program, um, and it happens every single day for 90,000 people is an incredible operation. Um, Have work, uh, so about 60 or cleaning bathrooms, or working uh, in the schools, or working uh, with the many, the over the 40 organizations that work throughout the camp. And the uh, those will start around nine o'clock. Um, but if you don't have food distribution, you might be going, or you don't have work, you might be going to food distribution, uh, which happens every two weeks. Um, you get all of your in-kind goods, your dry food as well as your vouchers. Um, and so for us, the last time we did it, it took about two hours to stand in line, um, and you get enough food for the next two weeks. Here's a little picture of us in line. Uh, 
And so we, uh, one of our, you know, one thing that we are really interested in was, you know, what are the food items that they actually give you here in the in the camps? What are the aid, what do the aid organizations choose? And so, you know, we go to distribution, we wait in this line, we, uh, you know, we we leave with two boxes of food, and we head back to our tent and open them up. And inside we have uh, a big bag of rice, we have lentils, uh, we have wheat uh, or bulgur wheat, which I'd never heard of before, but it's kind of like rice uh, and then we had salt in there as well and that's like the staple dry food that they give and then they supplement that with a thirteen dollar voucher for each person so every two weeks you get this big food distribution and then you get these thirteen dollar vouchers each and what it allows you to do is just to buy you know choose what you're what, what you want to buy so yesterday you know we went into the market and we bought tomatoes and spinach and threw that into our rice uh, and it just it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it actually allows people to have choice, to be able to find a bit of a sense of normalcy with their lives, which can be really important where you're living you know, inside of a refugee camp and you've been displaced from you know, your normal life. And so it's day 23 for us here. Uh, it's been a, a long time without a, a warm shower. We're pretty, it's been a very intense experience. We spend pretty much all day talking to our neighbors, understanding life in the camp. Um, which means we have about eight cups of tea a day, and every single cup of tea is about one cup, one cup, uh, one part tea, two parts sugar, uh, because it's customary every time you enter a caravan or any time you have a guest to drink their tea. Otherwise, it can be uh, an insult. And so, but it's really these moments when you're sitting down with a family, when you're sitting. Uh, sharing the, that small cup of tea that you, the real stories come out and people are able to feel comfortable talking with some of the most uh, traumatic or and difficult situations we've ever heard. Um, you know, people are coming from a war zone and, you know, the, our neighbors have shared um, some really difficult things but also incredibly inspiring things that are happening in the camp. Um, and, you know, these are some of the most resilient people we have ever met as well as the most generous. People yeah. who have Crossed the border with literally just the clothes on their back, have invited us into their homes, shared their little food with us, and have spent a huge amount of their time uh, really sharing and opening up to and telling us about their experience. Yeah, I think yesterday what we had a six-hour lunch. Uh, <laughs> so lunch is a big deal here that we learned, uh, but uh, about 11 a.m. till 5 p.m. yesterday. But uh, I mean, for us, so you know, we arrive in this camp. We finished registration, it's day one, and we're sitting in our tent for the first time. Uh, at that point, you know, coming from the U.S. and having never been to the Middle East before, we were honestly pretty nervous, pretty exhausted, kind of overwhelmed by just the whole process of what's been happening. Um, but we also knew nothing. Uh, we knew, we didn't know uh, that, in fact, we couldn't cook in the uh, shared kitchens here because only women are allowed into the kitchen. So that was a, a rude awakening on day one. <laughs> Uh, we didn't know where we were supposed to wash or to, uh, you know, wash our dishes and things like that. No. Really welcoming, just saying hi to us, uh, salam, which is hello in, uh, in Arabic here, and a lot of that was about as, de as deep as our Arabic went on the first day. Uh, and then we came back to our tent, and a small, uh, well, sorry, we came back to our tent, and the whole thing was clean. Uh, it had been organized, our, our blankets had been folded, everything had been kind of set up for us, and we ended up finding out who the culprit was the following day. It was our 10-year-old neighbor named Raouf. Um, and he had snuck into our tent just to make sure that we felt welcomed. And he'd even written on the outside of our tent in a, uh, in a marker saying, welcome to Zafari, uh, which was amazing. So he kind of you know, welcomed us in. And uh, this was our first friend there. And so Raouf became our guide. Uh, you know, he taught us how to clean clothes, taught us how to uh, cook the traditional tea in the
where we cut out. Oh, and we're back. <laughs> All right, I'm not sure where I cut out again. Um, <laughs> thank you for sticking with us. Yes, All this, uh, this internet here, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. You were sharing with us about your uh, 10 year old tour guide. And where did the audio cut out? Right about there. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. Okay. Sorry about this. The internet was working great yesterday. <laughs> um, I guess it's the price you pay in a refugee camp. Yeah. So the third time's a, a charm. <laughs> <laughs> um. So anyway, so Rauf, our tour guide, starts drawing in my notebook, and what he draws is a man sitting in a tent crying, and I was totally shocked because this is not something a ten-year-old normally draws, and you know, realizing, you know, when I asked him, you know, why did you draw this, Ralph? And he says, well, you know, this guy, he lost his family and his mom in Syria. And this is something that we all experience here. And this is a 10-year-old talking, you know, about what is unimaginable to me. And, you know, that was, you know, such, such an intense moment for us. I mean, it's what we quickly realized as well is that, you know, Ralph is one kid out of 40,000 that are here in this camp, uh, not to mention, like Zach said earlier, you know, 2.3 million ref uh, Syrians who have been forced to flee Syria as refugees in other countries. And, I mean, these are, all of them have, you know, lost someone ha or have been forced to leave their home or have they just experienced things that honestly have been really difficult to connect to or listen to over and over again. And we didn't even realize it at first, honestly, when we were... You're, you're just talking with people. I mean, they're kids. They're laughing. They're playing soccer with us. They wanted to learn magic tricks. So that's been definitely a theme of the last couple of weeks is, is playing, you know, doing a lot of magic tricks back and forth. Uh, but each one of them has, you know, has that story. And I think what it's been really important for us to learn is how you know, if someone like Rauf it doesn't, you know, hasn't been to school now for nine months. So if this crisis continues and he doesn't go to school for another year, you know, that's two years off of school. So, you know, he's missing a whole, you know, a whole part of his life, a part of his childhood and development. And not only that, but for all of Syria's children, this is an entire generation now that is missing that opportunity. And, and even if they do get to go back to Syria, hopefully sometime soon, they, you know, they won't have the education and the skills that they really need to uh, you know, to, to continue to develop and to, and to have a, a productive society together. So this is a big thing that we've been seeing is, you know, this, this issue with the lost generation. You know, if, if there's this many kids out of school, you know, this many people dealing with this level of trauma, this is an incredibly critical point in this crisis. And I think it's an incredibly important point where, you know, 
it, one of two things can happen. You know, people can enter these this cycle of anger if they don't receive any services, if they don't have education, or it can be an opportunity to address some of these and actually, you know, put people who might not even gone to school in Syria um, into good education. So it's it's this really this interesting point in the situation um, that we have here uh, that it's that we've been really diving deep into and hopefully the film that we produce will be able to talk a lot more about. Um, so sorry with all the delays uh, we haven't got to some of the stuff we want to talk about but uh, we definitely want to open it up for questions right now and hear what you guys want to know from us. Uh, so uh, yeah I got just got one question here that just came in uh, so we're going to Mr. Elson's Global Studies classroom at Craig High School. Uh, give us a wave so we know which group you are. Oh there we go that's all right, awesome. Alright all right. so this one, I want Evan Spry to uh, to ask me his question. Uh, he's got a good one. Boy, let's go. There he is. He's a handsome devil. There's Evan. What's up? <laughs> oh, what is the most important thing you have learned while being there? Ah, uh, so that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the, the most important thing that, that I've learned, I don't know about you, Chris, but uh, is that this could happen to anyone. And, you know, I think I, ha I didn't know exactly what, I, what, my, what an image for me of, of a refugee was, but, you know, maybe someone who, who was extremely poor, um, you know, who had left their country with, uh, you know, little education, but that, you know, that's not the reality. The reality is a refugee is anyone who has left their country, you know, under duress. And so for us, realizing that and, you know, in our neighborhood, you know, as in any society, there are people that are poor, but there are also accountants. There are uh, teachers. There are uh, college students who are two credits away from graduating college. And, you know, meeting those people and realizing that, you know, they're literally our counterparts um, inside of Syria, and that this could happen to anyone. That you know, given a war or even a you know a natural disaster, that any of us could become a refugee. That really sunk in, and uh, I think the most important thing is to realize that you know these people have functioning lives, and all of a sudden everything was taken away from them. And given an opportunity, given resources, given education, you know, people can come back. They can bounce back. And they, we've seen incredible resilience here. Great question. Thanks. Uh, so why don't we jump to uh, Mr. Uh, Helmstetter's AP Human Geography class at Farmington High School. Um, so uh, let's. Hannah T had a really good question. Why don't you come up and uh, and read one for us, Hannah? <laughs> Yes, stand here. Take okay. Yeah. Um, what is the atmosphere of camp like, and are things serious and gloomy, or is there still positive days even in the situation? That's a that's a really good question, and honestly, I mean, it, we we have to stress the you know the life, the the trauma that people have gone through, and the difficulty that people have gone through, is is unimaginable. I mean, it, is, it is very difficult to listen to every day and I think the, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen is actually the, the psychological problems that people are going through. You know, post-traumatic stress after being inside of a war zone, uh, feeling, you know, feeling really isolated, honestly, feeling alone, feeling scared. Um, and you know, one of our neighbors actually, uh, Uma Lee, uh, she's the, one of the first women we've actually gotten the opportunity to speak with. And, she, uh, she really exemplifies, I think, the hardship that someone goes through but, is, but hasn't given up. And, I mean, the positive side of what she's created uh, is really our inspiration to keep moving and going forward right now inside of the camp uh, where, you know, unfortunately, she, you know, she has been here for about a year now and she was forced to leave Syria uh, after her son was, uh, after she lost her son and... Um, she came into the camp. Uh, she was registered and put into a, a caravan here in the camp with her, along with her husband and her other son. 
Um, and she explained to us how you know she just wouldn't even leave her caravan for her for weeks. You know, she didn't want to leave. She didn't want to talk to anyone. She didn't want to go cook or or get her food distribution. And she actually started writing on the inside of the walls of her caravan, just like you see behind me, these kinds of walls, uh, just with a marker and, a, a, and uh, with charcoal actually writing uh, all her feelings, all her emotions, trying to express what was on the inside, trying to get overcome what she had dealt with. Um, and then she, it was through this kind of her own... Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. So we, uh, Just go from there. yeah, I mean, basically where Uma Ali, you know, she has not only been a part of this, this woman's group uh, initially, but has now actually started working for the International Rescue Committee, teaching other, you know, young girls and women uh, about, you know, about their rights, about what they can accomplish, teaching them and teaching them how to draw just like she can. And it's really, you know, it's that kind of, opportunity that she's found in crisis, which has been really amazing, you know, seeing how she has continued to overcome these these hardships, hardships that no one should ever have to go through, but is finding the positivity. And so I think that that's really, we've found a lot of cases like that, and there are a lot of Umalis and these, you know, 90,000 uh, people out here in the camp. So moving to, uh, do we want to answer one from the... So why don't we do, uh, we'll go back to Mr. Elson's Global Studies class for a sec. So um, let's see here. Do you have the questions along the side? Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to answer one from, from the main audience here. Uh, let's read a couple of these. Hold on. Let's just go for one of these first. Okay. So these are nice. People are just saying nice comments to us. Not really questions. So we're gonna go back to the. Uh, we're gonna go back to the uh, um, one of the classes. So how about Mr. Helmstetter's AP Human Geography class again? Uh, Maricia, uh, Marisha had a really had a question for us. Okay, it's Maricia, but. Um, <laughs> Does the, <laughs> does the camp feel relatively safe and secure? That's a great question. So Zatari, um, security is run by the Jordanian police. And, you know, we've heard, you know, the news has covered a lot of security issues here, but over the last six months, security here has dramatically improved. So when we arrived, you know, we were um, kind of tied into the community through UNHCR, who has a ton of contacts throughout the community has been able to really develop an incredible relationship with the, with the refugees. Um, and so when we were welcomed into our community, we quickly uh, had met pretty much all of our neighbors over tea. Um, and, you know, they, they promised us that they would keep us safe no matter what happened. So we, we felt pretty protected and, and actually has been incredibly welcoming here. Um, and that's something that we were really, really concerned about, you know, whenever you're filming in a situation like this, whenever you're actually spending this much time um, in a place with, you know, this, this kind of uh, 
vul or vulnerable or at risk population uh, is something that we're concerned about. But great question. We felt, but we felt pretty safe. So you know, just because the some of the internet issues, I think we're just going to do one more question back up to Mr. Ellison's global studies class. Uh, so uh, Sam uh, Plutchak just sent in a question. <laughs> hey there. Hey uh, Sam. <laughs> uh, what would be the best way a group of of American high school students could help? That's a good one. So um, there are a lot of ways uh, that you guys can help and what we've decided to do is um, is we've actually partnered with three organizations that are doing work here on the ground that we really believe in. Uh, there's Save the Children which is working specifically with with kids here on the ground and, and issues of youth and children. Uh, the International Rescue Committee who as I mentioned earlier from Umali, Ali is providing a lot of support to uh, around female women empowerment and providing centers here and then the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and they are pretty much doing a whole range of things from providing services to uh, to really you know, managing the camp here and what we right now actually you can come to our website at salamneighbor.org um, and you can find ways of just sharing the our videos, you can donate to one of these organizations. All of the money that you give will go directly to uh, to these organizations. It will not come to us. And it's really a way to allow each of us to make a small change, to actually, you know, with a little effort, we can change someone's life. We can help someone like Uma Lee get outside of her tent. We can help a kid like Rauf uh, get back into school and to really find a way to, to have a childhood again. And so you know, we really encourage you guys to come to salamneighbor.org to continue to ask us questions online on uh, on our Facebook at Living on One um, or our website, and then hopefully uh, in a couple months we'll have a um, we'll have a film for you uh, by summer. So you guys will be able to share the trailer to that and and be a part of the film. So and part of this journey for us, you know, at this point of time, really is to understand what is the biggest need. How does how does this experience in Zatari fit into the larger, you know, refugee experience around the world? What can we learn from that? And how, you know, and, and when we create this film, um, and and with you know people's feedback, we've been following this journey. Uh, we can figure out, you know, what are some bigger advocacy points? What are some of the biggest takeaways that we can apply um, even in the future? So again, you know, like Chris said, join us at salamneighbor.org. Sign up for the newsletter. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved and, and be a part of this. So thank you all. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate it. And sorry about the bad internet. Um, it's pretty amazing this can happen from Jordan, at least, from uh, a refugee camp. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys taking the time. And I think we're going to sign off now. But yeah, shoot us any questions on Facebook, and we'll continue to follow up with you. So thank you again, and uh, thanks for organizing it.